Okay, yeah, it's working. Okay. Okay. The eloquent voice on which the souls of the listening audience had been borne aloft on the, as on the swelling waves of the sea at length came to a pause. So one note there is that if you remember from the previous chapter, they mentioned a lot of things about like swelling waves and a lot of descriptors with the sea when they were discussing Pearl. So that's another recurring thing that's happening here again. So there was a momentary silence profound as what should follow the utterance of oracles. Then ensued a murmur and half-hushed tumult as if the auditors, released from the high spell that had transported them into the region of another's mind, were returning into themselves, with all their awe and wonder still heavy on them. In a moment more, the crowd began to gush forth from the doors of the church. Now that there was an end, they needed, they needed other breath, more fit to support the gross and earthly life into which they had relapsed. Then the atmosphere which the preacher had converted into words of flame, and had burned with the rich fragrance of his thought. So this whole part is basically just showing how essentially this is probably the highest moment of Dimsdale's entire career, and this is really la having a lasting impact on the people around him. Because as they say, with the gross and unearthly life, so it really kind of brought the Puritans to see what they're dealing with here, and probably is one of the most effective things he could have said. So, in the open air, the rapture broke into speech. The street and the marketplace absolutely babbled, again with the water imagery, in case you see that again from side to side with the pauses of the minister. His hearers not rest until yeah, his hearers not rest until they had told one another of what each knew better than he could tell or hear. According to the United Testimony, never had a man spoken in so wise, so high, and so holy a spirit as he that spake this day, nor had inspiration ever breathed through the moral lips more evidently than it did through his. So again, best thing he's pretty much ever done as they say multiple times, but this is one of the most things, and it kind of describes, like, a glorious atmosphere. And I want you guys to keep that word in mind as you read the rest of the chapter, is just the word glorious, because the descriptions of Dimsdale become more vivid, and it shows a lot about how the Puritans perceive him and his personality. So, its influence could be seen, as it were, descending upon him and possessing him, and continually lifting him out of the written discourse that lay before him, and filling him with ideas that must have been as marvelous to himself as to his audience. His subject, it appeared, had been the relation between the deity and the communities of mankind, with a special reference to the New England, which they were here planting into, in the wilderness. And as he drew towards the to the close, a spirit as of prophecy had come upon him, constraining him to its purpose as mightily as the old prophets of Israel grew constrained, only with this difference that, whereas the Jewish seers had denounced judgments and ruin on their country, it was his mission to foretell a high and glorious destiny for the newly gathered people of the Lord. So this whole part is saying how this seems to come specifically from God. It seems as if his whole speech was given to him as a message from an angel or some higher being to them, and it really had a purpose to it. So, and it was saying, like it says, glorious again. Just note that. So, but throughout it all and the, through the whole discourse, there had been a certain deep, sad undertone of pathos, which could not be interpreted otherwise than as the natural regret of one soon to pass away. Yes, their minister whom they loved and who so loved them all that he could not depart heavenward without a sigh, had the foreboding of an untimely death upon him, and would soon leave them in their tears. So Dimsdale just predicted his own death, and told them, basically in his speech, that they're all going to have success, and a lot of great things are going to come to them, but he's going to die. So that's what he told them, and they're all kind of freaking out about it a little bit. So, this idea of a transitory stay on earth gave the last emphasis to the effect which the preacher had produced. It was as if an angel in his passage to the skies had shaken his bright wings over the people for an instant, at once a shadow and a splendor, and had shed down a shower of golden truths upon them. So again, look, the way the descriptions become further in this chapter seems more and more as if they're making him a godlike figure, or just heavenly in general. So if you look like they're saying like the angel was over them, everything's just very important and very glorious, as I said earlier, so keep that in mind. So thus there had come to Rev the Reverend Dim Mr. Dimsdale, as to most men in their various spheres, though seldom recognized until they see it far behind them, an epoch of life more brilliant and full of triumph than any previous one, or than any which could hereafter be. So this is his 15 minutes of fame, essentially. He stood at this moment on the very proudest eminence of superiority, to which the gifts of intellect, rich, lore, prevailing eloquence, and a reputation of whitest sanctity could exalt a clergyman in New England's earliest days, when the professional character was of itself a lofty pedestal. Such was the position which the minister occupied as he bowed his head forward on the cushions of the pulpit as the close of his election sermon. Meanwhile, Hester Prynne was standing behind the scaffold of the pillory with the scarlet letter still burning on her breast. So 
this is one of the really important parts, I think, in this chapter. Kind of just reminds you why, at least why most people hate Dimsdale. Is because while he's having his 15 minutes of fame, there's a huge juxtaposition in the description shown. Hester is standing to the side, still suffering and with the shame of her thing. And, and, and noting that it's still in the same paragraph. Yes. Like the fact that he doesn't even break to a separate paragraph. Like, here's Dimian. <laughs> smack right up next to it. So, with the long descriptions of how Dimsdale's having his 15 minutes of fame and everyone's obsessed over everything he's been saying, the last sentence is the only thing kind of dedicated at this point to show Hester's still there, but she's kind of just on the side, still living in her shame. So, while they may have committed the same act, only Hester has seen the consequences thus far. So, now was heard again the clangor of the music and the measured tramp of the military escort issuing from the church door. The procession was to be marshaled thence to the town hall, where a solemn banquet would, com would complete the ceremonies of the day. Once more, therefore, the train of venerable and majestic fathers was seen moving through a board of pathway of the people, who drew back reverently on either side, as the governor and magistrates, the old and wise men, the holy ministers, and all that were eminent and renowned advanced into the midst of them. When they were fairly in the marketplace, their presence would greet was greeted by a shout. This, though doubtless it might acquire additional force and volume from the childlike lo loyalty with which the age rewarded to its rulers, was felt to be an, irrepress an irrepressible outburst of enthusiasm, kindled in the auditors by that high strain of eloquence which was yet reverberating in their ears. Each felt the impulse in himself, and in the same breath caught it from his neighbor. Within the church, it had hardly been kept down beneath the sky, it peeled upward to the zenith. There were human, they were human beings enough, and enough of highly wrought and symphonious feeling to produce that more impressive sound than the organ tones of the blast, or the thunder, or the roar of the sea. Even that mighty swell of many voices blended into one great voice by the universal impulse which makes likewise one vast heart out of many. Never from the soil of New England had gone up such a shout. Never on New England soil had stood the man so honored by his mortal brethren as the preacher. So again, just notice, he's still eating it up. Dimstill is basically having the best moment of his entire life, and it just it shows a lot that he's standing there kind of taking us all from giving his speech, yet he's also behind him, still has the shame, which I don't think Hawthorne intended us for it to pity Dimsdale as much, and I think that's why he included such a long description of his success following the speech, so you can see the differences between the lifestyle they've been living. And then also, again, earlier if you see, I don't know if this is intentional or not, but with the swell of the voices... Mm -hmm and all that, I don't know if it's going to highlight, and the sea, and they just continue a lot of the imagery he used to, like, nature imagery, apply it to her. But also wild, but also exactly. kind of constrained. And, yeah. mm -hmm. So, how fared it with him then? Were there not the brilliant particles of a halo in the air about his head? So, Ethel realized by spirit, by spirit as he was, and so apothesized by worshipping admirers, did his footsteps in the procession really tread upon the dust of earth? If you don't know the word apotheosized, it means like literally taken bodily from earth to heaven. Those yes. in Latin know it. <laughs> exactly. So that goes on to what I was going to say here too, is that the way they're speaking about him is he honestly is seen as a godlike figure amongst his peers. Everyone looked at him as if he can't be from earth because they think he must be something so special. There's no way he could be walking on the same ground they walk on. So... As the ranks of military men and civil fathers moved onward, all eyes were turned toward the point where the minister was seen to approach among them. The shout died into a murmur as one portion of the crowd after another obtained a glimpse of him. How feeble and pale he looked amid all his triumph. The energy, or say rather the inspiration which had held him up until he should have delivered the sacred message that brought its own strength along with it from heaven, was withdrawn now that it had so faithfully performed its office. The glow which they had just before beheld burning on his cheek was extinguished, like a flame that sinks down hopelessly among the late decaying embers. It seemed hardly the face of a man alive, with such a death-like hue. It was hardly a man with life in him that tottered on his path so nervously, yet tottered and did not fall. So after he gives his speech, it's shown here that it seems as if all energy with him is drained. Like, he's basically a walking corpse at this point. He has nothing in him, and he looks... Feeble and pale again, which I know they always say he's kind of just shaking in general. So that the fact that they're addressing that he looks so much worse can only show how bad he must look at this point. And contrasting with the energy that he had um, when he was like walking through the town in his maze mm -hmm. and, uh, and as he was giving his actual funeral speech, he had, he had color and he wasn't tremulous. Um, so that, that contrast is really important. 
Exactly. So the big contrast there is just showing how his effect during and after. And then you can see the effect he has on other people. So how they walk out of his sermon is much different than how he walks out, considering the fact Hawthorne is saying he can barely even walk in a straight line. It's Everyone's amazed he's not falling, yet the people are walking out, shouting, exclaiming, all this stuff, and he can barely even make it out alive. So, One of, the, one of his clerical brethren, it was the Venerable John Wilson, observing the state in which Mr. Dimsdale was left by the retiring wave of intellect and sensibility, set forward ha- hastily to offer his support. The minister tremulously but decidedly repelled the old man's arm. He still walked onward, if that moment could be so described, which rather resembled the wavering effort of an infant with its mother's arms in view, outstretched to tempt him forward. I'm going to stop here quick before I finish the paragraph and note this, the way that they describe his walking, as if he's walking towards like a mother with their arms outstretched. So you kind of have to think, like that means he's walking with a purpose. He's going somewhere. And it's kind of leading you, like, to wonder where exactly is he headed at this but point. He's also compared to, as a, to a baby. Yes. Um, and which is really curious because we know that Hawthorne usually uses, like, children and innocence and kind of um, trying to figure things out. And so, like, that, that consideration that this is the person that they uphold the most and uh, the fact that he's being considered kind of an infant. Um, yeah. Mm-hmm. So... And now, almost imperceptible as were the latter steps of his progress, he had come opposite the well-remembered and weather-darkened scaffold, where long since, with all of that dreary lapse of time between, Hester Prynne had encountered the world's ignominious stare. There stood Hester, holding little Pearl by the, by the hand, and there was a scarlet letter on her breast. The minister here made a pause, although the music still played the stately and rejoicing march to which the procession moved. It summoned him onward, onward to the festival, but here he made the pause. So... Dimsdale is stopping, finally, at this point, to look at Hester and Pearl. And again, note that before this point, he has never really addressed them in public. He has still managed to avoid that, rather than the initial one where he kind of yelled at Hester. But other than that, like he hasn't ever really addressed them in public or acknowledged them. So this is a interesting moment, because you're wondering what he's going to do. Because as the whole procession is moving onward, he can't, he can't help but find himself just standing there looking at them. So... Bellingham, for the last few moments, had kept an anxious eye upon him. He now left his own place in the procession and advanced to give, ex- give assistance, judging, from Mr. Dimsdale's aspect, that he must otherwise inevitably fall. But there was something in the latter's expression that warned back the magistrate, although a man not readily obeying the vague intimations that passed from one spirit to another. The crowd, meanwhile, looked on with awe and wonder. This earthly faintness was, in their view, only another p- phase in the minister's celestial strength. Nor would, it have been, nor would it have seemed a miracle too high to be wrought for one so holy, had he ascended before their eyes, waxing dimmer and brighter and fading at last into the light of heaven. So even at this moment, I'm sure that the pro- thought process between Dimsdale and the people watching him are very different because he's probably freaking out a little bit considering he's looking at Hester and Pearl, who are a product of his own sin. Like, Pearl is a product of his sin. Like, everything he did with that is probably just not the best situation in the time. And still no one knows about it, so he's probably thinking about the shame. But those around him are looking with awe and wonder. And they're, what Hawthorne says here is probably one of the things that is what makes me hate him still so much, is that everyone's looking onto him and thinking that he's literally going to be pulled into heaven right before their eyes. That's how like good they think he is. They think he's so strong with God and just so faithful and an amazing person that he could be pulled into the heavens right then and there, and it wouldn't surprise any of them. Like, that's what they're expecting. So, the plot thickens. He turned towards the scaffold and stretched forth his arms. Hester said he, come hither, come my little pearl. This is huge. This is giant, because he literally acknowledges them in front of everyone. Mind you, he still never talks to them in public. And, and yeah. also notice, like, his arms stretching forth in a Christ-like um, posture. Yes. <laughs> so, that is made to This is one of the biggest points, I think, in the entire book, is the fact that he is standing there with his arms out, saying, Hester and Pearl, come here. So, carry onwards. It was a ghastly look in wi- with which he regarded them, but there was something at once tender and strangely triumphant in it. The child, with the bird-like motion which was one of her characteristics, flew to him and clasped her arms about his knees. Hester Prince, slowly, as if impelled by inevitable fate and against her strongest will, likewise drew near, but paused before she reached him. 
At this instant, old Roger Chillingworth thrust himself through the crowd. Perhaps so dark, disturbed, disturbed and evil was his look, he rose up out of some other, out of some nether region to snatch back his victim from what he sought to do. Be that as it might, the old man rushed forward and caught the minister by the arm. So, after Dimsdale calls to them, Pearl runs, as she usually does, super excited with the bird-like motions. And while she usually hates Dimsdale, this probably shows the one moment she's kind of actually authentic about how she's regarding him. She's actually excited that he's addressing her in public, so that's a big deal. Hester is still kind of hesitant, which is expected, considering the fact she's been told to keep it a secret for this long, and then now he wants to tell the truth. And he just promised that they were going to run away together and live happily ever after. Exactly, and I don't really know <laughs> if that's possible after he tells everyone, actually, I am the father of Pearl, it was me, I don't think that's going to work out anymore, but we'll see. Um, and then Chillingworth is kind of also freaking out, because this is the leverage he had on Dimsdale, is that nobody knew that Dimsdale was the father, so he used that as a method of kind of shaming him and having him, like, have so much self-loathing that he punished himself. And after this moment, if Dimsdale tells everyone, Chillingworth doesn't really have that much leverage anymore over him. So he's kind of freaking out and telling him to, like, stop and don't do anything. So as he says, Madman, hold, what is your purpose? whispered he. Wave back that woman, cast off this child, and all shall be well. Do not blacken your fame and perish in dishonor. I can yet save you. Would you bring infamy on your sacred profession? Ha, tempter, methinks thou art too late, answered the minister, encountering his eye fearfully but firmly. Thy power is not what it was. With God's help, I shall escape thee now. He again extended his hand to the woman of the scarlet letter. Notice her name is not there. That is true. Hester Prynne, cried he with a piercing earnestness, and the name of him, so terrible and so merciful, who gives me grace, at this last moment, to do what, for my own heavy sin and miserable agony, I withheld myself from doing seven years ago. Come hither now and twine thy strength about me, thy strength, Hester, but let it be guided by the will which God hath granted me. This wretched and wronged old man is opposing it with all his might, with all his own might and the fiends. Come, Hester, come, support me up yonder scaffold. I still hate Dimsdale, especially, like, the most, I think, at this point, actually, considering the fact that he still can't even be strong enough for himself. And the whole thing he's saying here is like, I need you to be here with me, and I need your strength. After he gives all of the credit to God. Exactly. He credits God, and he says, but I like, I need you to help me. So even in this moment, he can't even own up to it, and he wants Hester next to him. And also he says, for my own heavy sin and miserable agony. He makes it sound as if his has been so terrible, like she has to help him at this point. Which is kind of ridiculous, but I don't, I mean, Hawthorne makes it pretty clear at this point that it kind of seems as if Dinsdale's being selfish right now. At least in terms of with Hester and Pearl. Maybe he's thinking in the long run, maybe he's trying to get some sort of salvation in the end, but this point is pretty telling of his character. So, the crowd was in a tumult. The men of rank and dignity who stood more immediately around the clergyman were so taken by surprise and so perplexed as the, pur the purpose of what they saw, unable to receive the explanation which most readily presented itself, or to imagine any other, that they remained silent and inactive spectators of the judgment which Providence seemed about to work. They beheld the minister, leaning on Hester's shoulder and supported by her arm around him, approach the scaffold and ascended steps, while still the little hand of the sin-born child was clasped in his. Old Roger Chillingworth followed, as one intimately connected with the drama of guilt and sorrow in which they had all been actors, and well entitled, therefore, to be present at its closing scene. So everyone around him is kind of in shock. They don't really understand what's happening, but they, they don't want to accept what's happening, actually. They can think of what's going on, but they refuse to acknowledge and accept it. And also note that Dimsdale is still holding Pearl's hand, which is interesting. So, But her name doesn't show up in that, in that particular thing. It's just uh, he's, he is connecting child. himself with the sin-born child, not Pearl as a human being. This is true. So, hast thou sought the whole earth over, said he, looking darkly at the clergyman. There was no one placed so secret, no place, no high place nor lowly place where thou couldst have escaped me, save on this very scaffold. Thanks be to him who hath led me hither, answered the minister. Yet he trembled and turned to Hester with an expression of doubt and anxiety in his eyes, not the less evidently betrayed that there was a feeble smile upon his lips. Is not this better, murmured he? than what we dreamed of in the forest. So he's saying, isn't it better that I tell everyone we don't run away than we actually go away and, like, to escape this all? Isn't this better for me to go, like, come clean in front of everyone? 
<laughs> so, I mean, I would prefer to run away. Maybe that's just me and Hester and probably every other person on the face of the earth, but it's fine. So, Dim still likes it, though, and he's thinking again, this is probably better for me. Because it's all about Dimmy. So, again, selfish, but it's fine. Whatever. We'll see what happens now. I know not. I know not, she hurriedly replied. Better? Yay. So, we may both die and Little Pearl die with us. So, Hester's being real here and saying after she, he comes out and says that he did this, it's more likely that they're, all three of them are going to die, but we'll see how it goes again. For thee and Pearl, be as God shall order, says, said the minister, and God is merciful. Let me now do the will which he hath made plain before my sight. For Hester, I am a dying man, so let me make haste to take my shame upon me. So this point's also telling of Dimsdale, because he's saying, um, God will do what he, like, what should happen for you guys. Don't worry about it. He's merciful. Like, he'll forgive you guys. But as for me, he told me to tell people and I'm about to die, so I have nothing to lose at this point, is basically what he's saying. So that's great. Partly supported by Hester Prynne and holding one hand of little pearls, the Reverend Mr. Dimsdale turned to the dignified and venerable rulers, to the holy ministers who were his brethren, to the people whose great heart was thoroughly appalled, yet overflowing with tearful sympathy, as knowing that some deep life matter, which, if full of, if full of sin, was full of anguish and repentance likewise, was now to be laid open to them. The sun, but little past its merit, meridian, shone down upon the clergyman and gave distinctness to his figure as he stood out from all the earth to put in his plea of guilty at the bar of eternal justice. This point, also important, because they say, the people whose great heart was thoroughly appalled yet overflowing with tearful sympathy. I do not think I have seen one instance in the entire book where they give much sympathy, if any, to Hester. But when Dimsdale walks up, they decide, okay, he probably has a good explanation. He has a good reason. Like, let's hear him out. So they say that they know he has, like, sin, but it was also full of anguish and repentance. As it, But they never actually even considered the possibility of Hester, of Hester, Hester, Hester um, repenting or give her any sympathy. So this is another big moment here because it shows they don't really care much about Hester, but they notice that Dimsdale might be an okay guy in their eyes. So... People of New England, cried he, with a voice that rose over them, high, solemn, and majestic, yet had always a tremor through it, and sometimes a shriek struggling out of the fathomless depth of remorse and woe. Ye that have loved me, ye ha have deemed me holy, behold me here, the one sinner of the world. At last, at last, I stand upon the spot where seven years since I should have stood, here with this woman whose arm, more than the little strength where wherewith I have crept hitherward, sustains me at this dreadful moment from groveling down upon my face. Lo, the scarlet letter which Hester wears. Ye have all shuddered at it. Wherever her walk hath been, wherever so miserably burdened, she may have hope to find repose. It hath cast a lurid gleam of awe and horrible repugnance round about her. But there stood one in the midst of you, at whose brand of sin and infamy ye have not shuddered. So, he acknowledges them all, addresses the fact that he should have been there, should have been up on the scaffold. And this might be the one moment where I maybe feel a little bit, a little bit sympathetic towards Dimsdale. But then also the fact that he kind of just, Hester's standing next to him, and she's like, look at her, you did this to her. So it's kind of one of those things, like, I don't know if you guys ever have it when your parents are talking about you and you're right there, and you're like, why are you talking about me instead of to me? Like, I can speak for myself or say anything like that, but they kind of just speak as if you're not there. That's what I picture this moment to be like. Because it's kind of in front of everyone, but... And he never once in this... He just says, hey, there's somebody in the midst of you who was her consort. He hasn't said that it's him. So, still, his final <laughs> moments here, in front of everyone, cannot say, I did this, but... Like I said, it's fine, whatever. It'll all work out, I hope. It seemed, at this point, as if the minister must leave the remainder of his secret undisclosed. But he fought back the bodily weakness, and still more, the faintness of heart that was striving for the mastery with him. He threw off all assistance and stepped passionately forward a pace before the woman and the child. It was on him, he continued, with a kind of fierceness. So determined was he to speak out the whole. God's eye beheld it. The angels were forever pointing at it. The devil knew it well and fretted it continually with the torch of his burning finger. But he hid it cunningly from men and walked among you with the mien of a spirit mournful because so pure in a sinful world, and sad because he missed his heavenly kindred. Now at the death hour, he stands up before you. He bids you look again at Hester's scarlet letter. He tells you that, with all its mysterious horror, it is but the shadow of what he bears in his own breast, and that even this, his own red stigma, is no more than type 
of what has seared in his inmost heart. I'm going to stop here again. And nope. Still doesn't say, I did this. He's talking about himself in the third person. Sounds a little pretentious to me, but like I said, it's fine. Whatever. And he's saying that God saw it, the angel saw it, the devil knew it. Everyone knew it was happening except for them, basically. Because he hid it so well. So, also great. And, again, so this is just another point where you kind of want to acknowledge the fact that he still doesn't say he did it. He's kind of talking to himself third person, which is beautiful, I guess. Standing here that question God's judgment on a sinner, behold, behold a dreadful witness of it. With a convulsive motion, he tore away the, ministri the ministerial ban from before his breast. It was revealed, but it were irreverent to describe that revelation. For an instant, the gaze of the horror-stricken multitude was, concern was concentrated on the ghastly miracle. Stop for a second. Yes. Just notice there that, like, it was re revealed. Like, that is the most important, like, it's a, it's a small declarative sentence, and he doesn't do that very often. And so notice, he's like, he's ripping open his shirt the way that, um, that the same way that Chillingworth did yep. way back um, in those other chapters. And then I love Hawthorne for this very moment. Like, it was revealed. Like, everybody saw it. But I'm not going to tell you what they saw. Um. Yeah. <laughs> so while you all sit and wonder, Hawthorne still yeah. does not think it's important to the plot line, apparently. So... Uh, with contrary on the ghastly miracle. While the minister stood with a flush of triumph in his face, as one who, in the crisis of acutest pain, had won a victory. Then down he sank upon the scaffold. Hester partly raised him and supported his head against her bosom. Old Roger Chillingworth knelt down beside him with a blank, dull countenance out of which the life seemed to have departed. Thou hast escaped me, he repeated more than once. Thou hast escaped me. May God forgive thee, said the minister. Thou too hast deeply sinned. So, with the, probably in his final moments, because it kind of seems like Dimsdale's about to die real quick, um, he likes to say to Chillingworth, it's okay, God's going to forgive you. Like, I hope he forgives you, because you have sinned so badly. He withdrew his dying eyes from the old man and fixed them on the woman and the child. My little pearl, said he feebly, and there was a sweet and gentle smile over his face, as of a spirit sinking into deep repose. Nay, now that, bur now that the burden was removed, it seemed almost as if he would be this sportive with the child. Dear little Pearl, wilt thou kiss me now? Thou wouldst not yonder in the forest, but now wilt thou wilt? So, also says, Nay, now that the burden was removed, it seems as if it was, this was a great idea. So now that he has nothing to lose, he's like, why not? Like, what a, like what's the worst thing that can happen? I'm already, like, everyone already knows. I'm probably already going to die. So, like, what's the worst thing? So, go ask Pearl to get him. Pearl kissed his lips. A spell was broken. The great scene of grief in which the wild infant bore apart had developed all her sympathies, and as her tears fell upon her father's cheek, they were the pledge that she would grow up amid human joy and sorrow, nor forever do battle with the world, but be a woman in it. Towards her mother, too, Pearl's errand as a messenger of anguish was all fulfilled. So this part is also big, because I think this is the one part where Pearl is kind of seen and described as that child who's just yearning for her father. Because, like, she's always been wild and uncontrolled, but in this moment it shows that she really just wanted her father at that point. And this is her awakening. Yes. This is that moment of awakening. Mm -hmm. It's very sad. Very tragic. Finally gets her dead at the very end, so. Hester said the clergyman, farewell. Shall we not meet again, whispered she, bending her face down close to his. Shall we not spend our immortal life together? Surely, surely, we have ransomed one another with all this woe. Thou lookest far into eternity with the bright dying eyes. Then tell me what thou see. Hush, Hester, hush, said he, with tremulous solemnity. The law we broke, the sin here so awfully revealed. Let these alone be in thy thoughts. I fear, I fear. It may be that when we forget our God, when we violate our reverence for, each, for the... I'm going to pause here before I go to the next page. Because she's saying, will we meet in heaven? Like, won't, or, like, heaven, hell, purgatory, wherever they go. She's saying, like, won't we meet again after we both die? This can't be the end. And he tells her to stop talking. So... That's great, very romantic. So, reverence for other souls. It was thenceforth vain to hope that we could meet hereafter in an everlasting and pure reunion. God knows, and he is merciful. He hath proved his mercy most of all in my afflictions, by giving me this burning torture to bear upon my breast, by sending yonder dark and terrible old man to keep the torture always at red heat, by bringing me hither to die this death triumphant ignominy before the people. Had either of these agonies been wanting, I had been lost forever. Praise be his name. His will be done. Farewell. That final word came forth with the minister's expiring breath. The multitude, silent till then, broke out in a strange, deep voice of awe and wonder, which could not and 
as yet find utterance, save in this murmur that rolled so heavily after the departed spirit. A couple things to note here. Notice that his ignominy, we've heard that word ignominy um, all throughout describing Hester. His is triumphant. Um, his ignominy is tri triumphant, whereas hers has been um, something to bear, um, etc. And then also that awe and wonder that Valeria noted at the beginning of mm -hmm. the chapter has shown up now three or four times in this chapter, um, but that uh, in, in how people are responding um, to, mm -hmm. to him. Um, and that, that contrast with how that everything has gone with Hester. Mm -hmm. And another thing that you could note about this part is that he's saying, like, God is merciful, he has proved mercy in my afflictions. And he's talking about, he's like, how much have I suffered? Like, look, like, this burning torture I have to carry around, this man here torturing me, bringing me here to die right now. But, like, after he dies, Hester's still going to have to deal with the consequences of what happened. Because he just said everything. And they're gonna be, so they're going to know the fact that she, like, hit it the entire time and then also she's been having the torch too except she had to physically wear it so she had social oh shoot what is the word uh, okay. isolation yeah. social like isolation basically and then the yonder dark and terrible old man was her old husband so i don't know if that's important in the, the whole long like grand scheme of things but i kind of feel like it is so he's saying all these things that have hurt him but at the end of the day they've all affected hester the same if not more, maybe a little bit less in certain aspects, but, so in his last moments, with his final words, he's saying, look how much I have suffered, everyone, goodbye, and then he dies, and then everyone's still in awe and wonder, so, I hate Dimsdale, in case you guys cannot tell, <laughs> he's horrible, and I think that concludes the chapter, so I hope you enjoyed this audio cast slash live reading, that's good.